BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. And hello everybody, today is Friday, another Cooper Friday, welcome to the show, how's everybody doing? On Fridays this year, I've been talking to you guys about D.B. Cooper, the man responsible for the only unsolved skyjacking in U.S. aviation history, and in this episode, I will be responding to the book Into the Blast by Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins. In 2023, I had the opportunity to interview Jeremy Berthume, and he is a supporter in the theory that Kenny Christensen was D.B. Cooper, and he is discussed heavily in the book Into the Blast. And I've also mentioned this book multiple times on the channel, and I realized that it was finally time that I was going to sit down, read the whole thing, and give you guys my honest response to this, just to give the book a fair shake. And because this book was co-authored by Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins, I'm mostly going to be referring to it as just Into the Blast, and if I say they, I'm referring to the co-authors. But firstly, I would like to uh, say thank you to everyone who listened to the episodes that came out this week on the Freeway Phantom and on the CIA PSYOP manual for the Thursday and Tuesday episodes, irrespectively. Thank you so much for tuning in to Black Box Online Radio, and as always, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. Now, this is a book that deals with a suspect. And I find that no matter what true crime case you're following, whether it's the Zodiac Killer Mystery, Jack the Ripper, or D.B. Cooper, I think it's so much more fascinating to look at the observations that the writer is making about the case as a whole, as opposed to just simply who was the perpetrator, who who is their suspect. We're going to see a lot of that with the D.B. Cooper story. D.B. Cooper boarded a plane in 1971 going from Portland to Seattle. He gave a note to one of the flight attendants named Florence Schaffner saying that he had a bomb in his briefcase and he opened that and revealed the contents of what appeared to have been a bomb. He drank bourbon and soda while he was on the flight. He smoked eight rally cigarettes and then the passengers were let off the plane and he was remaining there. One of the flight attendants, actually two of the flight attendants, Alice and Florence, both left the plane. Florence, though, does return to get her purse, and then one of the flight attendants goes to collect a ransom that D.B. Cooper asked, $200,000 and four parachutes. And then the flight takes off headed toward Mexico City, but then it turns out they're not able to fly to Mexico City, so they actually decide on Reno, Nevada, and that somewhere, somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, D.B. Cooper parachutes into the night, never to be seen or heard from again. To the best of everybody's satisfaction, to people like Robert Blevins and Skip Bordius, they would say that, well, D.B. Cooper met up with a lot of people. He had an accomplice who set this whole thing up. He was interacting with people throughout the rest of his life. They believe that D.B. Cooper was somebody who worked for the same airline, Northwest Orient, named Kenny Christensen, who was a purser, or more, more like a head flight attendant, for that particular airline. Now, as far as um, the notion of an accomplice goes, I was talking about this last week on the Cooper Friday segment. Some people just think it's absolutely impossible that D.B. Cooper could have had an accomplice. There's no possible way that D.B. Cooper could have communicated messages to an accomplice in 1971. He wouldn't have had a cell phone. He wouldn't have had email. He wouldn't have had a laptop computer. All of that stuff completely rules it out. But even this book here, Into the Blast, gives a possible scenario. And they're not even endorsing it in Into the Blast, but they're just saying that the accomplice could have been on board during the flight, during Flight 305 that's going from Portland to Seattle. And I appreciate those types of challenges, talking about how you wouldn't even have to completely think that an accomplice has to be on, a gro on the ground. And the people who completely eliminate that type of uh, thinking are just like, well, yeah, there's no way he could have communicated messages to somebody on the ground. Well, what if the accomplice were on the plane with him? And if D.B. Cooper gets charged, then the accomplice is supposed to intervene in some in some particular way. And I always appreciate it when people are just challenging these blanket statements. When someone says, that's impossible, and then somebody stands up and says, now wait a second, maybe it's not. But there is a particular segment that I would like to read from the book, Into the Blast by Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins, 
full credit goes to them. And I'm actually going to read a um, somewhat of a lengthy segment from the book, but I think that it's important because you've heard everything that I've laid out. D.B. Cooper skyjacks the plane. He goes to Seattle. He gets the money. He gets the parachutes. What happens after the jump? And Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins are going to lay this out. And we have a couple of things that are actually going to be happening before the jump, but let's just have a read here. D.B. Cooper told the crew to try for Phoenix. They replied Reno would be better. Cooper didn't argue the point. He knew a trap by the police was probably waiting for him in Reno, but he had no intention of falling into it. I'm not staying aboard that long anyway, he thought. After Tina Mucklow instructed him on how to lower the stairs, Cooper startled her by pulling out two or three bundles of the ransom money from the sack. He held it out for her, and he said, Take it. It's yours. Each bundle consisted of two thousand dollars in twenties, although some were slightly more and some were slightly less. She refused the money. All right, he said. Go up front and stay with the others and close the curtains between first and class and coach. Dina Mucklow glanced back for a moment before she shut the curtains and caught a glimpse of D.B. Cooper preparing for his jump. He was putting one of the main back type parachutes, putting on one of the main back type parachutes. Although Tina Mucklow had no way of knowing the significance of it, D.B. Cooper chose the older military style parachute in what was known as the NB6 container. The parachute he rejected was the newer sport type chute. This choice made some people wonder later whether he was an ex-military paratrooper or not. The sports, drew, the sports shoot would have given him an easier, less intense shock o on opening. It has been speculated that perhaps he'd never used one before, especially if he had only jumped in the military and didn't understand its operation. Captain Scott called Cooper on the intercom. Anything else we can do for you? No, Cooper said brusquely. The crew continued flying towards Reno at 200,000 miles an hour. 200 miles an hour. Did I say 200,000? Got ahead of myself. At 200 miles an hour. Somewhere behind them, chase planes were attempting to follow the aircraft, but the weather and darkness made it futile, and on the ground, the news services were already jumping on the story of Dan Cooper, his demands for parachutes and money, and the takeoff from Seattle Due to a mistake by a reporter, his name was listed as D.B. Cooper, and the name stuck. Cooper shoved the bundles of cash that Tina Mucklow had rejected back into the money bag. He hefted the parachute onto his back and tightened the strap securely. Then he fastened one of the emergency chutes to his chest. Although he didn't know it, the emergency chute was a training device only and didn't work. He stuffed his glasses into the briefcase and then pulled the ripcord on one of the other parachutes that was unused to free the contents. Pulling out the parachute material, he used a long pocket knife to cut some of the cord from it. It was known to be a bit tricky to use this type of paracord for tying things together, but it was also very strong. D.B. Cooper also carried a paper bag with him. No one knows what was in the paper bag that Cooper carried on board the flight. It may have contained a map, a compass, gloves, perhaps, as with the briefcase containing the phony bomb, it was never found. I have to throw in a particular interjection here. It is um, reported by this book, and it will be mentioned uh, later on in the book, that the bomb that D.B. Cooper had was a dud, and Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins were arguing that it was a dud, but we don't know that 100%. And for the longest time, I've said that D.B. Cooper's bomb was a dud, but it's possible that it was real. And a lot of the reasons that they provide about why the bomb was a dud are not things that I can accept wholeheartedly. For example, they bring up a quotation from Ralph Hummelsbach, the FBI agent who was following the D.B. Cooper case most closely, and he stated that he thought that the bomb was a dud because it was reported by the flight attendant who saw the bomb that the, it was made with red dynamite, and red dynamite didn't exist. Dynamite was normally either yellow or orange. But according to the research of Ryan Burns, who runs the D.B. Cooper Sleuth Channel, red dynamite did indeed exist. And I'm just going to get to the heart and soul of what I think. Now, is it possible that D.B. Cooper had real dynamite in his bomb but the bomb was not configured to actually detonate. I'm sure he could have detonated it from the fuses, but he took real sticks of dynamite and he arranged it in a way 
that could not be detonated from a remote trigger, because I think this would have solved all the problems. If he were caught with the bomb, it would have had real dynamite, and it would have been real to a certain extent, even though he wouldn't have been able to detonate it from some type of hand trigger that he had been threatening to do so with, because it just it would have been so much less risky. It would have been less riskier for him to detonate the bomb or to, for him to carry a briefcase with a bomb in it that would not have, you know, possibly just blown up because he mishandled the detonator. That's what I personally think. But um, the book Into the Blast is going to argue that it was just a dud the whole time. Now we'll go back to the story. D.B. Cooper removed his black J.C. Penny clip on tie and discarded it. He tied the briefcase, and the money sack lightly together with more pieces of parachute cord and then took hold of the long cord already and tied it around his waist. He secured it firmly to the money and the sack of the briefcase and the combination. Following Tina Mucklow's instructions, Cooper lowered the aft staircase. They dropped a couple of feet and stopped, still held up partially by the wind, rushing past beneath them. He took a firm hold on the bundle and pulled it close to him, to his body, with his free hand. He tested the stairs gingerly with an outstretched foot and started down. The stairs dropped as they took his weight, causing some oscillations that the flight crew noticed and several minutes had passed since the pilot had lowered the landing gear, but Cooper knew that they were either at or close to the jump point. He fought his way to the bottom of the stairs, his heart racing, and the tremendous roar of the engines was both deafening and an incentive to do what he had to do to get away. D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane. The wind whipped him against his face while the rain pelted him and soaked through his clothes. The bundle hit the ground first, then Cooper. The landing jarred his senses, and he rolled across the ground, climbing to his feet, and he quickly collapsed the chute and took stock. He was a little sore, but still in one piece. Stripping off the reserve chute from his chest, he tossed it aside. There was no one around in the dark. A soft drizzle soaked him even more, and it made him shiver. He saw the bundle lying nearby, and it was still attached to his waist by the cord. He untied it and looked around quickly, trying to figure out his location. He was in a field. A short distance away, he spotted some road signs, but it was impossible to read them in the dark. I think I saw woodland off to the west when I was coming down, he thought. He started digging. This is the important part. He started digging the ground, and it was soft and gave easily. As he worked, he noticed ruefully that the reserve chute had been a trainer. He breathed a sigh of relief that he didn't need it. Disconnecting the harness and backpack from the parachute, he quickly buried it. He stuffed the briefcase and the money into the empty backpack, and then he hoisted it onto his shoulder. The reserve trainer and harness he carried with him for a while, and then buried them as well. In a different spot, he hoped that none of it would be found, but even if they were, the parachutes would not give any clues to his identity. However, they could reveal that he had made it safely to the ground, so he, so they had to be buried. And this is something that I really wanted to talk to you guys about. What do you make of this analysis? What do you make of this theory? D.B. Cooper jumps out of the plane. He ties the money and the bomb, which they claim to have been a dud, to him. And those are just sort of hanging beneath Cooper. He ties them to himself with the paracord. And they're almost just dangling beneath him as he's falling. He lands in southern Washington, and then, once he touches his down in this field, he then launches a plan to bury the parachute. And, um, you know, then he puts, you heard that, he puts the money into the knapsack that was used for the parachute, and that's how he escapes. Now, this is going to be some inclement weather at night. I think that that would have been a very big effort. It's not purely impossible. It would have taken him a very long time, I think, to um, dig up the earth, even if it's raining, and bury the parachute. I mean, how much time is he spending doing that, and he's not noticed or interrupted? But I guess it would have been somewhat of a secluded area of southern Washington, all the same. But what do you think of that, that D.B. Cooper landed, and he chose to bury the parachute, and that's why that it was never found? Although, I think that some investigations could find out whether or not that's true in the near future. But this book is going to continue onward, and it's going to deal with um, the suspect, Kenneth Peter Christensen. 
and Kenny Christensen's brother Lyle is someone who brings him onto the scene. He gets very suspicious about D.B. Cooper and Kenny Christensen, and he says that Kenny Christensen passed away in the 1990s, and on his deathbed, he said that he had something that, to confess to him, but he wasn't able to do so. And Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins are going to be making the case that Kenny Christensen was indeed D.B. Cooper. Some of the supporting evidence is that D.B. Cooper was an experienced paratrooper, although he hadn't jumped in years. He was someone who would have been in his mid-40s at the time, which does seem age-appropriate for D.B. Cooper, and he learned his experience in the Army Air Corps. And not only this, this is included in the book Into the Blast, not only was Cooper, not only was Kenny Christensen trained in paratrooping and skydiving, but he had also trained to jump at night, and he's deployed to the Pacific Theater for World War II, but by the time he arrives, the war had ended. However, he did conduct duties in um, Japan, sorting out things. He actually goes into the mailroom, according to this book, and that was his job for the end of the war and post-war duties. Then Kenny Christensen goes to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he decides to try and get a job with Northwest Orient, which is the airline that was used by D.B. Cooper. Kenny Christensen would work first in airline mechanics, jet mechanics, and he is sent to a place called Shemyang in Alaska. And this is almost, um, well, it is an island in the Aleutians. It's an Aleutian island, and he is more or less just working on a place where they stop for fuel overs on the way to Japan, and he stays there for four years, which is much longer than what most people do. According to the book Into the Blast, most people would stay on this island, this Alaskan island, for four years, dealing with the cold and the fog, as it puts it. But then, actually, Kenny Christensen is sent um, on his next assignment and gets a either a relocation or a transfer, or he is no longer working in Alaska, but he ends up working in Bikini Atoll. And I was shocked when I read this because Bikini Atoll is not famous for having some type of um, stopover destination for Northwest Orient Airlines. Bikini Atoll is famous for, well, um, nuclear bomb testing, and it says all of that in the book Into the Blast. And that may have contributed to Kenny Christensen passing away early because um, it's of the specific element that would have affected him would have been strontium-90. But um, yes, I was really quite surprised that he worked there at all. But then Kenny Christensen goes back to Washington State, and you know he is um, living in Washington State, southern Washington, and he has a friend who used to work for the airlines as well named Bernie Giesman. Although he isn't referred to by name in the book as Bernie Giesman, he is given the pseudonym Mike Watson, and his uh, wife is referred to as Katie Watson, and both of them end up living in houses near Bonnie Lake, Washington. And I'm just some guy from West Virginia. I was just thinking about that. There's even some photos of Kenny Christensen's log cabin in Bonnie Lake, near Bonnie Lake, Washington. And I was like, wow, when I was like 18 or 19 years old, growing up in West Virginia, you know, just turning into an adult, that would have seemed like paradise. But it's not. It's not. It's not. Because uh, Mike Watson, a.k.a. Bernie Giesman, is going to get divorced, and there's going to be a very nasty divorce later on that's discussed in the book. But I digress from that. The real issue, though, is a motive, something that would have been a driving factor for Kenny Christensen to commit the skyjacking and for D.B. Cooper to commit the skyjacking because, as I've talked about it with the um, David G. Hubbard books, that the motivation that they believe that D.B. Cooper would have used for the skyjacking would have been financial. It was done for the money. It was not done for a particular cause. It was not done for a per particular political movement. It wasn't done for the thrill. They believe that it was done for the money. And this is purely, purely based on interpretation, not on certifiable fact. But somebody like Kenny Christensen, who had this type of paratrooping background, although he hadn't done it in 25 years, would have been frustrated with Northwest Orient Airlines because the way they describe it in the book Into the Blast is that he goes to work. He'll go on flights from Washington State to Manila or to Tokyo, but then he is out of work for maybe one week or two weeks. And this doesn't only happen in the 1970s. This isn't only in 1970 and 1971. This is something that would have gone on for decades. I mean, we're talking about like 
this is just the way that Northwest Orient flight attendants are dealing with things. And so there are multiple strikes that happen with the airlines. And I mean, this could have, um, yes, they're in the 1970s, but even earlier, even earlier, that's one thing that Into the Blast really talks about. In the 1950s and 60s, flight attendants were experiencing very similar complaints and frustrations. And it's this whole concept of they're going to work and then they're out of work for one week, two weeks, or three weeks before the next assignment. And there are all types of issues that are going on with the airline. This is going to become very important for D.B. Cooper's um, behaviors and activities on Flight 305. Number one, D.B. Cooper said that he had a grudge. He didn't have a grudge against anyone specific, but he just had a grudge. Could that be something referring to his financial situation and being frustrated that he felt cheated out of a certain amount of money because of his career with the airlines? Point number two, Tina Mucklow made a comment about um, being from Minnesota and Minneapolis, and D.B. Cooper said that Minneapolis was nice. Kenny Christensen spent time in Minneapolis, even though he had relocated to the Pacific Northwest by that point. So are these personal connections that reveal that Kenny Christensen could have been D.B. Cooper? So some of the things that are discussed in the book is that they track down the first officer of the plane, who was named Bill Radizak, and he conducts an interview for this book, and the full interview is played. But mostly, they ask him the question, do you think that D.B. Cooper survived the jump? And he said something that I thought was really odd. I had to do a double take on this. And that is that my heart tells me I hope not. My brain tells me no. And I was like, wow, wow. What a what an odd statement. But ultimately, he thought that D.B. Cooper did not survive the jump. And one of the reasons why was because Again, he is also somebody who is working on the planes, a pilot from the Pacific Northwest. And when he was not working, he said he would explore the areas outside of Seattle, and it was just surrounded by brush and thicket, and specifically blackberry bushes. He just said there were an enormous amount of them, even to the point where they start growing over the railroad tracks. And he's like, D.B. Cooper would have had, you know, a very small area and time to jump before he just would have landed in thicket and absolutely um absolutely terrible terrible locations for a skydiving landing but that's all in sort of central washington if i understand what bill radisack has laid out when you get to southern washington it seems like there are a bunch of wide open spaces and i even told you guys about the documentary in search of which was actually a TV show that was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, and they did a D.B. Cooper episode, and they just said, oh yeah, Washington State is filled with forests and thicket and underbrush and all of that. But at the same time, when they showed their videography, I'm like, well, now I'm seeing a bunch of wide open spaces here that would be very suitable for the landing of uh, somebody who is skydiving. And moreover, moreover, they talked about this in the book very clearly that multiple people have attempted the jump or at the very least they have jumped under similar conditions and they've there's a you know at least one reference to someone attempting the exact same jump and was able to succeed and Earl Cossey even talks about this the man who packed the parachutes for DB Cooper that he would if DB Cooper was able to pull the ripcord then he would have been able to land Earl Cossey is discussed in the book, and there's some things about him that are somewhat unfavorable. Firstly, it's that he is reported as someone who is not able to remember the details too well. As I said, he's the person who packed the parachutes for D.B. Cooper. He was a parachuting instructor in the In Search Of documentary. He's even seen um, jumping from about 10,000 feet and successfully landing during um in um southern washington albeit that was not a night and it wasn't raining but he is reported as someone who just turned in to be somewhat of an unreliable um not exactly witness but an unreliable participant in the investigations because he was always changing his particular stories and observations Tina Mucklow is the flight attendant who brought D.B. Cooper the parachutes and the money, and she's talked about a lot in the book, and she interacted a lot with Ralph Himmelsbach, the FBI agent who was following the case, and she is some just reported as someone who starts out by 
firstly being an honest participant, but one thing that she wanted to just make very clear is that she didn't talk that much about the Cooper case because she wasn't able to remember all of the details. By 1985, she said that she couldn't remember the situation clearly, and that's something that you can um, kind of take in two ways. Number one, is she just somebody who wants to just put this behind her and move on with her life because it's just one day, November 24th, 1971, or is she somebody who actually doesn't remember? And what the book Into the Blast is trying to put forward is, at the very least, she stated that she's not trying to be uncooperative. She genuinely can't remember the details of everything that she experienced by that point and onward. And, you know, I really want to give credit to Tina because Tina Mucklow was somebody who gets um, accused of a lot of things. A lot of people think that she was in on it, that she was the active participant, that she was the quote-unquote accomplice who was on board with D.B. Cooper and, like, they were in on this together. And I don't think there's any evidence for that. But one thing the book Into the Blast really wants to reinforce is that Tina Mucklow is someone who did not necessarily immediately just jump into being a recluse, just jump into um jump into uh hiding and such. And she, you know, made comments, she interacted with Ralph Himmelsbach, he even knew her address for years, but she just simply said that after nineteen eighty five she was no longer able to remember the details of the events very clearly. You can take that for what you will. But some additional points that are discussed in the book Into the Blast relate to how Kenny Christensen could have acted um, after the skyjacking. The first is that he would have landed. He buries the parachute. Then he is going to um, go to a place called Tina Bar that was relatively close by, bury the money, and the money was specifically buried by Cooper. And this would have been done to throw people off, make them think that he wouldn't have survived. And it's a little bit unclear, but he has this conversation with Bernie Giesman, who's referred to as Mike Watson in the book, when he just simply says that, why did you put the money in the river? And he says that he did that to throw them off, or planting it as a false lead. It's almost just like a, something that would have been confusing. Maybe they think that he would have died and wouldn't have survived the jump and so on, something that would distract them from investigating Kenny Christensen. Now, as I said, Mike Watson, a.k.a. Bernie Giesman, is going to be a very influential person in the story. They have this setup where Kenny Christensen and Bernie Giesman spend the Thanksgiving of 1970 together. 1971, they don't spend Thanksgiving together, and the story that's shared in the book Into the Blast is that they had a trailer that they were using for some type of camping trip, and then they were gone, but they spent the Thanksgiving of 1972 together, and that was the last time. So, is this not insinuating that they weren't actually going on a camping trip? They would have um, just use that as a cover story, the ruse. That's the reason why they would have chosen to uh, disappear for a while. Some type of, type of excuse that they could have shared to Katie Watson, and that's the name that they're giving to Bernie Eastman's wife in the book. And Kenny Christensen, of course, would not have been married. And, I mean, I completely, I completely follow what they're saying. There's even going to the details, and they're speculating that Bernie Giesman and Kenny Christensen would have showed up with the trailer later on, and they would have just looked like they had returned from a camping trip. No matter how messed up and disheveled Kenny Christensen would have been carrying a backpack or um, this parachute uh, type of backpack knapsack, he would have been completely fitting with this particular alibi. Now, Bernie Giesman is contacted by Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins, and he's interviewed for the book, and they immediately began to suspect him because he talks about Kenny Christensen's financial situation. And I told you that there are problems with the flight attendants and their earnings and their wages in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in the 1970s. And Kenny Christensen would have been directly affected by this, the strikes. He would have, you know, been going on a flight to Manila or Tokyo, and then he's out of work for two or three months. And they talked to Bernie Giesman, and they asked him about all of this, saying that, well, you know, did Kenny Christensen 
um, have any financial trouble. And he says, what? No, I didn't think so. I thought people who worked for the airlines made really good money. I thought the people who were in Kenny Christensen's job made really good money. And they began to suspect him because that just seems completely contrary to everything that has been laid out by the course of events, that someone who is best friends with Kenny Christensen, who also worked for Northwest Orient at a point, should have known this stuff inside and out, that these strikes, that the infrequency in work would have caused financial hardship to Kenny Christensen. And would he have been frustrated about that? Would that have been a reason to commit the skyjacking? Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, well, if this guy worked for Northwest Orient, why wasn't he witnessed or recognized by anybody who would have been on the plane or working at the ticket counter. And Bill Radizak, who's interviewed for the book, the uh, first officer for the plane, even said that Northwest Orient wasn't the biggest airline in the world. It was actually relatively small, and he knew a lot of the people. And it's probably, probably at one point, he knew Kenny Christensen's name, even if he couldn't recognize him by face, because it was a small airline. And, you know, he is somebody who has worked for them for years. But the honest answer is they think that Kenny Christensen just got lucky, that he is somebody who got on the plane, and he is even thinking about this. As they, they, they try to do recreations and reenactments on the book End of the Blast, and D.B. Cooper's walking to buy his ticket, and he's like, good, no one I know is working here, they won't recognize me. He gets on the plane, good, no one I know is working here, they won't recognize me. And they think that Kenny Christensen just got lucky. But I really want to know what you guys think. What do you think about um, D.B. Cooper landing successfully and burying the parachute as oh, a means of discovery, as a means to avoid discovery? What do you think about D.B. Cooper deliberately planting the money at Tina Bar? What do you think about D.B. Cooper having an accomplice that was involved some way, somehow, in the transportation or execution of um, the plan. Like, what do you think about all of this and how does it come together? And moreover, what do you think about Kenny Christensen as a D.B. Cooper suspect? Some additional points are, of course, that I've talked about in my own standalone episode on Kenny Christensen. Number one, he smoked cigarettes and he drank bourbon. He was reported to have had um, a certain preference for bourbon. And D.B. Cooper ordered bourbon and soda on the plane and he smoked eight rally tip cigarettes. And... What do you think about um, Kenny Christensen as a suspect? My overall take is that every point you put in favor of Kenny Christensen, you have to take one away. I mean, it's that, okay, so he has this confession to his brother that there's something that is um, that he just wants to admit to him, but he can't tell him what it is. A lot of people just simply think he meant that he was gay. As I said, he never married. He was a lifelong bachelor, and they think that he was talking about being a homosexual, and Point number two, you can look at all of Bernie Giesman's, you know, wild stories and so on, not being aware of what's going on. This guy just could have been a little bit clueless and not necessarily um, cooperative and just messing around a little bit. And then point number three, why didn't the flight attendants or the crew, the pilots, recognize him afterwards? I mean, really, it's the people, the people that would have recognized him would have been Florence Schaffner and Tina Mucklow, who interacted with him the most. They never saw him again if he was working out of Seattle, if he's continuing to work for Northwest Orient. But one point that Bill Radizak really wants to reinforce is that he never saw Cooper and he never spoke to Cooper. Now, the uh, pilot... Uh, Scott, Scotty as they call him, was, did speak to Cooper via the intercom, but they're also behind the curtain, and they did not go back and interact with Cooper at all. But at the same time, you think that, you know, just all these types of interactions would have been very, very risky for somebody like Kenny Christensen. And I do admit, of course, the elephant in the room, Kenny Christensen does heavily resemble Composite A, which is known as the Bing sketch. So there are some strong points, but then you have to take points away. He's really only about a 5 out of 10 or 50% suspect for me. But I'd love to know what you think about Kenny Christensen. And one more time, the book is called Into the Blast by Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins. And I do recommend it to you guys. I think that... um. I think that it's very interestingly written, and more and more I'm exploring this concept of people trying to recreate the thought process of somebody else before they did something like, you can even call this like a psychological autopsy after the person has died. And that's like, what was somebody thinking in the events that were leading up to a major event? 
And the reason why I'm more curious about this is because I started doing more episodes about Jack the Ripper here on this channel. Every Wednesday, I do an episode about Jack the Ripper called Ripper Wednesday. There are just more and more books that have been written where people are trying to recreate the thought process of the Ripper. There's a short story called Ripper by Dean B. Cloud. There's the autobiography of Jack the Ripper by James Carnack. There's Jack the Ripper, a true love story by Wynne Weston Davies. So there is just, it's something that I think is an interesting mental exercise all the same. And it's really showing that D.B. Cooper did, did turn into a cold case. During the interview with Bill Radizak, he openly says, uh, you know, it's kind of disappointing that D.B. Cooper has now become a cold case. But the final question for you would be, do you think that the mystery of D.B. Cooper will ever be solved? Please put your ideas in the comment section down below. My name is Ned Dahan, Black Box Ned. You can get me on Facebook under the names Black Box Online Radio or Ned Dahan. You can get me on Instagram under the name Black Box Ned 88. TikTok Black Box Ned 88. Buymeacoffee.com to help support the show Black Box Ned 88. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. That's all for me now. And I will see you guys on Monday to talk about the Zodiac Killer, Zodiac Monday. Until next time.